Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Tech and Talk. I'm really pleased to have a good friend, Liz Rice, with me, who's on the Aqua team these days. And she's been doing a lot of work around Kubernetes, and she's got this exciting new, and maybe a couple, another exciting new, so there may be two things combined in this talk, um, KubeBench, that I'm going to get her to do a deep dive and explain what that is and um, the, the reasons for developing it. Um, what we try and do with these tech talks is have conversations. So we're going to let Liz do her presentation um, and we'll have live Q&A at the end of it. If you have questions during her talking or demoing, um, ask them in the chat. But the whole goal here is really to just look at some new innovations around Kubernetes, cloud native stuff, and things that I'm interested in, and you are too, hopefully. So um, without any further ado, uh, Liz, take it away. Thank you very much, Diane, and um, hi, everyone out there in the world. Um, yeah, so when Diane asked me to join the, the Tech and Talk today, we had um, just announced KubeBench, um, but I am going to take a couple of minutes at the end to talk about a new and exciting thing we just announced today called Manifesto as well. So yeah, loads of exciting uh, open source things going on at, uh, at Aqua Security at the moment. So uh, let me talk a little bit about KubeBench. So I thought I'd start by just setting the scene a little bit with, um, uh, if I can work my uh, slides anyway. There we go. Right, um, just a little bit of um, background really about um, how security fits into the container lifecycle. Um, at Aqua, we, um, you know, our product is about securing containerized deployments. Um, and what we've done with KubeBench is a nice kind of open source complement to the, the, you know, the enterprise product that we have. So container security really can apply at all sorts of different stages through the container lifecycle. Um, really quickly, you know. When you built the image, you want to um, know that that image came from, um, well, maybe it was built on a base image that um, doesn't contain vulnerabilities. So you want to keep scanning your images for, for vulnerabilities. Um, you want to know that the base image came from a reputable source. You don't want somebody being able to kind of inject uh, unwanted exploit code into container images that you then build from and store in your registry. Um, so that's kind of the first step of image assurance. Then we get on to something we call environment hardening, and that is really where KubeBench fits in. Um, so this is around saying, is the host that we're running on secure? Is the container engine that we're running on secure? Um, there's these benchmarks that I'll come to in a moment um, that help us test for those things. Um, we also have uh, parts in our product that will help container users ensure that their secrets are managed securely. Um, I could talk, you know, for a whole other half an hour or something about uh, managing secrets in containers. Um, but suffice to say that, you know, that that's an important um, aspect to managing your containers securely and making sure that you're not passing, you know, keys to your database or other important elements uh, around to your containers without some kind of care and retention. Um, and then we get into the, the things that I think are, are really quite interesting about um, security in the containerized world, which is looking at um, restricting your the privileges of your containers to the least privileges that they need to run. Uh, so that can be making sure that a container doesn't run as root. Um, it could be um, making sure that you're using a security profile like a, a setcom profile or an app arm profile appropriate to your um, container images. And then finally, there's network controls, making sure that traffic only can flow between, between pairs of containers or between containers in the outside world um, as expected. So 
we can see through those kind of five stages that security plays a part all the way through the container lifecycle right from building the image all the way through to it's running and it's communicating with with other containers and with with the outside world so there's a whole load of things that um it could go wrong a whole lot of opportunities for bad actors to kind of try and exploit and uh, I think that brings us on to the the Center for Internet Security so that's what CIS stands for the Center for Internet Security and they have lots of publications around best practices for all sorts of kind of parts of your IT infrastructure and uh, a couple of months ago, they published a Kubernetes benchmark. Um, there's also a Docker benchmark, and we actually have an implementation of that within our paid for product. But we decided that for Kubernetes, we'd build it um, open source, um, put it out in the open and contribute it to, to the community. So the benchmark test itself, um, I'll just uh, show that document. So this is actually the 1.1 version. It's the, the second version and it's uh, been updated to include um, security best practices for Kubernetes 1.7. And if I kind of scroll to the contents page, um, if I go here, um, hopefully you can see there's 252 pages in this document. It's not a small document. And it's got all sorts of sensible best practices around um, how your host should be configured and how your um, Kubernetes settings should be set up. And a lot of these tests are, are easily automated. They're, they're, they're written in such a way that it's easy to automate them. So I'll just bring up an example. Um, hopefully that's big enough for people to read. Yep. Um, great. <laughs> um, so um the the benchmark consists of a number of descriptions of the problem what the reasoning is behind this potential problem um a way of checking whether or not you've um got that particular problem on your on your system in this example it's really saying run ps to to find the cuba api server executable and check whether or not it's got the allow privilege allow privileged argument uh, set and tests like that are you know really very easy to automate and that's what we've done with the, the with the benchmark and you also get some remediation information you know what to do if your uh, if your benchmark fails essentially um, and it'll discuss the impact and obviously every every deployment is unique and there may be reasons why you choose to ignore some of these recommendations but as a base point it's a really good place to start you know some some expert people have gone to the trouble of thinking through lots of potential security flaws so uh, um, it, it's a good place to start and by automating the tests we're hoping that this makes it really easy for people to um, to run them and, and keep their deployment secure and there are different tests for different types of node. So uh, the, uh, there's a section for master nodes that we can see here. There's also a section for regular nodes and for federated nodes. And uh, perhaps the next thing I should do is actually show, show it kind of in action. So, well, before I run it, I'll just um, take a look at the uh, the config files. Um, so, for example, if I look at the master YAML, the, the tests are all configured in YAML format. And we can see, you know, there's a pretty clear correlation between this YAML and that text description that we were just looking at. And the reason why we've chosen to do it in YAML is that it's much easier to add new tests, keep them up to date as the benchmark evolves. And um, what we were talking just before the, the call about uh, um, documentation changing quickly in Kubernetes, you know, the whole world of Kubernetes is evolving really quickly. So there is no doubt in my mind that these benchmark tests will need to evolve to, uh, to keep up with that. 
Yeah, but the you know it came out pretty quick after 1.7 was released too. So whoever is at CIS is actually doing a pretty quick turnaround on and getting these updated. That was impressive, actually, wasn't it? Yeah, I um I've, I've joined in with that conversation. I I you know my contribution is small compared to to some of the other folks in there who've been authoring these um these tests. But yeah, they had that out really in a matter of a few weeks after the the 1.7 release. So it's really impressive and. Uh, and, and good work. And I think there's more, you know, um, uh, you know, more help would always be welcome there. I think um, uh, this actually came up on a, a, a SIG auth call, I think it was, um, where, you know, the, there's some pretty intricate security settings in Kubernetes, which I am by no means the expert in. And seeing how those things interact with each other is kind of expertise that um, I'm sure that the CIS would like to kind of, you know, leverage that expertise in the benchmarks going forward. Um, but yeah, they're, they're certainly very um, key. They, you know, I think they want these benchmarks to be appropriate living documents that people, you know, find authoritative. Um, so yeah, really, really good folks working on that. So um, that's kind of the let's quit out of that if I can figure out how there we go and um, I'll just show it's just a, a YAML file for each of the different types of tests so the master the node the federated and there's also um, an overall config file now this is um, uh, something that we've recently um, added you know Qbench is also um, you know, moving to keep up to date. Um, there are different installation uh, tools, you know, COPS, CubeAdam, things that might be pronounced in ways that I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce them. <laughs> um, and, and, and OpenShift as well. I'll, I'll, I'll mention OpenShift uh, shortly. Um, but these tend to have different names of the executable. You know, there's Hypercube, um, they may put the config files in different locations and have different names for those config files. So um, we've created uh, some what we call installations, which give us um, some default settings for these different installation tools. Um, so, for example, here's one for COPS, um, which you know we hope is correct, but uh, corrections very much welcome. Um, and then you'd run the appropriate or you'd select the appropriate installation and if you needed to you could modify these to make sure it matches your um, your deployment um, it's actually one of the things i think is um you know quite tricky for the people writing the benchmark to kind of keep track of what the best practices should be given that there are so many different tools that actually result in slightly different uh ways of configuring uh communities so finally, I just wanted to um, give this one a run. So uh, we'll run the master tests and uh, it takes very little time. So I'll just scroll back to the beginning of the output. And uh, you can basically, you can see that there's a number of warnings and then for each uh, test, it either fails or passes or um, there may be some with warnings. Yes, there's some with warnings. Um, this is um, typical for CIS benchmarks in general. Uh, it, it adds up to, uh, at the end, we can see uh, a number of passes, fails, and warnings. And um, you might also want to automate this to kind of keep track of whether things have changed. Um, so we support a JSON output for the same test results. And you get the remediation so you can uh, you know, follow the instructions to try and improve the security on, on, you know, on your own deployment. There's quite a few things, as you can see, on this particular machine that aren't set up perfectly according to the, uh, to the best practices. So what sort of uh, privileges do you need to actually run this command? Um, to run the command itself, you don't really need any special privileges at all. You need to be able to see the um, uh, the output of PS, and you need to be able to um, 
uh, some of the files will check the permissions on um, config files and, and check the ownership. So if you don't have permission to even see into those directories, you wouldn't you wouldn't get a good result. But you don't need you know root or anything like that. A, a regular standard user should be able to run these tests. Um, so uh, let me see what else if I had in my slides. There might be yeah. So the GitHub, it's all on, on GitHub, both the, the code, which is a, a Go application, and uh, and the configs for the, the tests. Um, we would love to hear from people, you know, if they have any issues, if they, um, particularly with the configuration for different installation tools, um, you know, we're trying to trying our best to kind of cover the different bases, but, uh, uh, you know, we'd love to hear from people who are actually using it in the field if they have any issues. Okay, um, I was just going to quickly mention this whole thing of um, automating compliance. I actually stole this slide from, from one of our marketing decks um, and it, it's kind of showing how the, in this case, it's actually the Docker benchmark, but you use that to, you can see it's quite small, but uh, it, it sort of adds up the, the number of warnings and, and passes and info. Um, totals for that benchmark so um for kind of uh, regulatory for compliance purposes you can keep track of well you know how was this host set up what were the um you know was there some sudden change in our host configuration that meant that our um you know some machine or, or some set of machines was suddenly not um as secure as it was before so the intention is to automate all these things um, and make it just really easy for people to, to you know, to know what state their machines are in. And um, I thought I would mention OpenShift really briefly because um, it's obviously, you know, it's near and dear to my heart. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think in a lot of cases, OpenShift have kind of gone above and beyond what Kubernetes does for uh, a lot of security aspects and there's a whole bunch of things here that i'm you know not super familiar with so don't ask me any difficult questions about openshift specific security <laughs> um uh, suffice to say that you know i know that it's a, a you know a real uh focus for for red hat and for the for the openshift team so i'm i'm sure there's a lot of really you know good work has gone in there so there might be an argument that says well how much of these kubernetes tests are really applicable um, so we've actually um just opened an issue uh, in the last day or two um to kind of raise that question because i think on the one hand you know a lot of things are in common and um some of the things like config file permissions and ownership um the defaults from OpenShift are going to be great, but um, there's no reason not to automate just testing to make sure. Yep. yep. Um, and I also noticed that um, some of the, um, well, a lot of the, the benchmarks tests refer to kind of uh, parameters that you pass in on um, the, you know, when you're executing the binaries in, in Kubernetes. And um, I think those can be passed through um, sort of transparently in OpenShift, so just checking for those is, is not a bad idea. Um, but, you know, whether there's, uh, well, it'd be really good to hear from the OpenShift community about their thoughts for, yeah. but, you know, but whether. What would be great is to see an extension, extension to your test specific for OpenShift. Right, right, yeah, if there's demand for that, then uh, that can be a really good approach, I think, yeah. 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 And I think you're going to see over time, um, more enterprise distributions and of Kubernetes that are, you know, like like OpenShift, value adds, um, container platforms that have Kubernetes under the hood that are doing a whole lot of other things, you know, not just adding security, but doing multi-tenancy and all of those kinds of things. And OpenShift will eventually not be the only one. Um, mm. So benchmarking will change a little bit. And I think that's an interesting aspect to this whole thing too. And mm. Mm. More going beyond vanilla Kubernetes benchmarking would be uh, an interesting yeah. thing. Yeah, and it'll be interesting, I think, both from the tools perspective, but also from the CIS perspective, you know, whether 
um, whether that benchmark should be extended to cover OpenShift or have a separate one for OpenShift. I, you know, I, I really don't know what the right approach is there, but. Uh, I'm sure there's someone at Red Hat who has an opinion of that. So um, <laughs> well, we'll look forward to hearing from whomever that is out there at Red Hat Lab and who tells me, you know, what I should be saying and what I shouldn't be saying about this. But <laughs> it's, uh, I, I think it's automation is the key to everything, not just security, right. but everything, CI, CD, all, you know, the whole upgrade, everything. So the more we can do that, the better. And I come up, I actually come out of um, early on in my career, an IT audit background so for me this is near and dear to my heart and being able to automate this stuff is great because it makes it much easier for the compliance officer in any enterprise to accept this new world of containers and microservices if they can see a report that says you passed the CIS, you know, CIS's benchmarking blah 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 um, they, they want that piece of paper and the documentation and, and it to be a repeatable process that they can show at the end of every quarter or every upgrade or wherever. So this kind of stuff is pretty damn important in my humble opinion. Right, right. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that, you know, every time we can automate anything in security or anything else that's just kind of repeatable, you know, automations means we're more likely to catch problems and, and that's got to be a good thing. Yeah. Right, um, so I think, oh, I think I have one more slide which has the uh, link to, where is it? The link to uh, that issue about um, OpenShift config in Kubebench. So that's kind of a, a starting point for a discussion maybe. Um, I'd love to hear more. I think that was everything I was going to say about um, uh, Kubebench itself, but is it okay if I briefly mention Manifesto? Would you like to ask a question about that? No, there are no questions, Jessica. I think I've been asking them as we go. Tell us about this new project that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, if, um, you know, you might remember that before I joined Aqua, I was uh, working on a project called Micro Badger, which uh, looked at container metadata, in particular, looking at labels and the metadata that you could associate with a container at build time. And it had always kind of, uh, it, you know, I'd always been aware that, you know, well, that only solves part of the problem. There's lots of metadata that you want to associate with container images that changes after the image has been built. So examples of this could be, um, a really great example is the vulnerability scanning report. So, you know, if you scan that image, let's say every day, over time that report will change because um, even if the, the image itself doesn't change, new um, vulnerabilities can be found. Um, so it's really nice to be able to associate, um, you know, that report, the latest version of the report with that image and, you know, know exactly where they're, um, put together. Or another example might be um, keeping track of whether that image has been through um, whatever approvals it needs before it needs to be, before it can be deployed. Um, you know, test status, um, going through some kind of security audit maybe, you know, uh, and you can't, you don't want to rebuild the image to keep track of this information because, well, it wouldn't be the same image anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we've done with Manifesto is, uh, I mean, it's a, a prototype tool at the moment where you can um, basically add metadata to uh, kind of alongside an existing image in the same registry. So we store it as data inside the registry and uh, we just have a simple tool that lets you get, put a list um, well, you, any arbitrary metadata. And the joy of storing it in the registry is, well, there are two things. One is it's existing infrastructure. So, you know, if people have got their own on-premise registry, great, can keep the metadata in the same place and not have to worry about um, an additional set of um, security concerns or access permissions and what have you. And the other thing that's really cool is, um, um, and we haven't implemented this yet, but this is the, the direction of travel, 
is to use notary to sign the metadata so you know that the metadata in the same way that you can know that the image is the correct image that you know came from the place that you expected it to come from the same can be true for the metadata um, so that's really what it is and we you know literally released it this morning so uh hoping to hear some feedback so far there's been some 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 good uh some good comments and and i think i'm going to be talking about about it at the um moby sig scanning meeting coming up shortly uh so yeah that's that's manifesto so, so you, um you mentioned something notary in there can you explain what that is yeah so notary is um a component I'm pretty sure it's part of Docker rather than part of the Moby project, but I might be wrong. Not, no, I'm not sure about that actually. Um, but anyway, it came from Docker and it's an implementation of something called the Update Framework, TUF or TUF. And it lets you, um, uh, so you have a piece of data, whether that's uh, an image or maybe it's some other software package. I think that the tough spec came out of software packaging in general, or in our case, in, in the case of Manifesto, the data could be some metadata. And you basically take a hash of the, the data and you sign it and you store it in notary. So you can verify um, if you've got a piece of data in your hand, you can check with Notary that the hash matches and the signature is what you expected. So it you know, came from the person that you expected to, to sign it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it, it's a really good way of proving provenance. And uh, it also has um, kind of making sure that it's the latest version. So I think particularly in this context of software packages and updates, um, if you request, you know, you, you say to Notary, I want the, 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 well, the Notary information about this particular package, it will always give you back the latest version, not some old version. Cool. Uh, so, uh, yeah, really nice piece of technology. And I think Docker have done a great job in using that for image provenance. Cool. Okay, well, I'm going to have to look up. That. I hadn't heard that one before. That's why I was asking. So, mm -hmm. so manifesto is like fresh off the press, press, um, and you're, you're off and running with it. So, if if Notary isn't an open source part of Docker, um, is there a replacement for it, or you know, if Notary is open source. I was just uh, pausing whether or not I couldn't remember whether it's moved into Moby or not. Um, okay. So, cool. uh, but it's open source either way. So if you want people, if people want to get a hold of you or um, to work to give feedback on CubeBench or to, to test it or or make a pull request against it or manifesto, what's the best? Yeah, there you go. The best. There way we go. Yeah. So those are the, the both projects are on GitHub under Aqua Security, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know I'm on Twitter. That's a very good way of getting hold of me. I think. Um, yeah, I'm also Liz at AquaSec.com. So more than happy to hear from anyone with feedback or comments or questions or contributions or ideas all welcome so, and you also mentioned i think a couple of sigs uh, is kubebench coming um or have you done any presentations into any of the kubernetes sigs on this yet or is, yeah. is there is there a sig where you know a cube security sig that you're sitting in or something like that yeah there's there's a a, a sig called sigorth Yes. Um, which covers kind of all kinds of security aspects, really. Um, and uh, yeah, I presented it, uh, presented QBench uh, as into that SIG and also into the Kubernetes community meeting. Um, and actually, there was a question there about whether we'd like to see QBench become part of Kubernetes. And the answer is absolutely yes, we would. Um, there's like an incubation process that we're just starting to look into. Um, so if anybody's listening to this and would love to be a sponsor or a champion for Kubebench. I would love to hear from you. <laughs> uh, well, that's that, that's always that the the thing with Kubernetes is that they're really trying good. They're actually kind of good about um, 
not incubating too much and maybe pushing things out to the CNCF to be incubated over there as side projects like Prometheus and, and other many, many other things, VetCD and you know, a bazillion other things are coming over there soon. Um, so it, it's really interesting sort of um, semantic question of what should be in Kubernetes and what should be mm -hmm. um, in a cloud native relation. This, this seems pretty um, Kubernetes specific. So yeah, but it, the whole concept of automating your benchmarks and, and using this, it, it seems to me that this is something that the sys folks ought to be involved in too. Um, the, the, you know, besides writing these white papers, that this kind of tooling um, and making it available for the different things that they do benchmarking on. I'm wondering if we can't get mm -hmm. something, and especially whomever it was that turned out this 1.7 paper so fast, um, get them involved in it as well. Yeah, it seems like and there's obviously some overlap between, you know, the set of people who are working on the CIS and, you know, working on mm -hmm. Kubernetes as well. Yeah, there, there must be. So we'll have to track those folks down and figure out where, where they're at because it almost seems like something that that person should, you know, or persons should be involved in um, in this as well. And you know, when you click to download the PDF of the benchmarking, there should be another little link there to click and download KubeBench and install it and run it. So That's a good idea, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That kind of cross community collaboration, it, you know, trying to do that, that'll that'll get you a long way, um, and um, also probably help you with updating. Um, on each release too, so and I'm doing that. So um, I'll definitely reach out to um, my OpenShift and Red Hat security people and and send this all away over to them and see see where they're at um, and if we can get some OpenShift origin community love in there as well. Um, Sounds perfect. Lovely. Yeah. Fun stuff. But this is um, these are the kinds of projects that really make Kubernetes um, production ready and make people happy about deploying them on their enterprise clouds or in their private clouds or on their public clouds. So I, I really appreciate the work you've done um, and Aquaset continue, continues to do um, in the security space. And it's going to it's going to be an interesting each release every three months. It's going to be interesting keeping up with it all. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the momentum is huge, isn't it? And, and it's really exciting. So, um, are you coming to Austin for um, the KubeCon that's coming up in December? You... Yeah, I'm not sure, but I hope to be there, yes. Yeah, that, so, we'll be there. I'll, I'll be there the day before doing an OpenShift Commons gathering. So, we'll probably have a bunch of our OpenShift security people there as well um, doing one of their lunch breakouts on um, SIG. So, if you come, oh, yeah. um, yeah. Anyone listening to this wants to come and, and talk about it or see it in action or talk about other security issues um, on December 5th in Austin, Texas, um, OpenShift will be having another gathering. And, uh, it, it's the day before um, KubeCon kicks off, so there'll be uh, it'll be a good intro for all of the K Kubernetes and cloud native stuff that come. I think that worked really well in Berlin, so. Uh... Yeah, it, was it was it was lots of fun for me. It was like the best prep class you could take for going <laughs> into KubeCon because it was like, oh, okay. So if you don't know all the vocabulary, come to the OpenShift thing, learn the vocabulary, figure out who the thought leaders are, so you could stalk them through the next two days of conference. <laughs> your questions answered. It was great. So um, I'm really pleased to do that. And that's kind of how I coerced Liz into doing this talk um, was running into her after um, that gathering in Berlin. So I guess it was, was it? Yeah. It was. It's like, you know, I'm pretty good at this uh, coercion thing. So, <laughs> so the, the one question I always ask everybody on these tech and talks is, um, you know, we all have different um, favorite things out there in um, cloud land and technology land. It's, who would you like to hear from on an upcoming speech or someone you think that the community at large would be not just specifically to OpenShift even or Red Hat. Sure, yeah. So I thought of a couple of people um, for that. One is uh, my uh, former colleague and very, very good friend, Anne Curry. Ah, yes, um, yes. So she has been doing some uh, some research into kind of real life cloud native usage, you know, talking to, to a bunch of enterprises. So uh, 
Um, I'm sure she'd have some interesting uh, things to say about that research. Uh, and, and the other person I was thinking of was um, Gareth Rushgrove from Puppet. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, because he's um, always doing really interesting things around, particularly this whole metadata thing, which I kind of find interesting. And uh, yeah, and, and he's always got some really you know, good experience and good opinions to, to share. Yeah, Anne, Anne is a wonderful speaker and always has you know great sort of thought leadership. Um, yeah. And is, is very inspiring and Gareth always tries to coerce me into doing something so <laughs> I, it's like yeah okay or going to some puppet conf event and presenting on something um, which is always fun too so yeah two good suggestions so thank yeah. you for that and, um, thank you for your time today this should be up on the OpenShift blog um, and on YouTube in a day or so depending on how fast the internet gods work and um, <laughs> The editing webmaster person who does all of my editing for me, LJ Banks, who's just awesome. Um, so I really want to thank her for that work and thank you for coming today. And hopefully we'll get to see you sooner than December, somewhere out there on one of the upcoming multitude of conferences and events that we have to go to. But um, Thanks. This, I hope so. this has been my pleasure. It's been great. Really. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Take care.